Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, our webinar. Uh, this is I'm Lisa Dakanai. I'm the president of the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia. Um, welcome to our fifth um, COVID-19 Social Enterprise Response and Visioning Effort webinar um, series. No? And uh, the first webinar was actually um, with World Fair Trade Organization Asia. The second was with Dompet Duapa in Indonesia. And then um, the Center for Social Innovation Promotion in Vietnam. And then last week, we had Bina Swadaya. But there are two objectives of the webinar series. Uh, the first is to um, share, network, and collaborate towards um, a responsive social enterprise recovery program given COVID-19. And the second is to uh, actually um, evaluate and reconfigure uh, what we call the Social Entrepreneurship uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDG acceleration platforms, uh, which we were actually starting to discuss to launch to accelerate the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals um, before COVID-19 happened. You know? And uh, for the so social entrepreneurship um, SDG acceleration platforms, we, we were discussing with Gandang Palikasan, Human Nature, the possibility for them to actually lead uh, a platform on social enterprises as mechanisms or vehicles for uh, decent work. Yeah. So, um, but for this webinar, um, we will be focusing on sharing with you um, the response that Gandang uh, Palikasan Human Nature actually did in, uh, for COVID-19. No? And we're very lucky to have with us uh, two recognized icons of the, uh, what we call the new generation social entrepreneurs in the Philippines, um, Anna Meloto Wilk and Dylan Wilk. Um, Anna is the president and co-founder of Gandang Kalikasan, and of course, Dylan is co-founder as well, but he's chairperson of the board. So um, without much ado, I would like to turn over the floor to, to Anna and Dylan. Anna will be introducing Gandang Kalikasan as a social enterprise, while Dylan will be uh, explaining their um, response to COVID-19. So uh, may I call on Anna, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Anna. Uh, I am uh, streaming from uh, Laguna. It's a very rainy afternoon <laughs> here with us. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, to spend this afternoon with you. Thank you for also taking the time um, to be with us. I know it's uh, really, you know, uh, been very helpful to learn and to uh, be in a support community to learn from one another. Um, technology has allowed us also to still stay connected despite having to um, shelter in place, having to stay where we are. Um, and I think um, from our side as a, you know, um, in the social enterprise, in this um, um, sphere, it's also kind of strengthened um, values that we've had even before the pandemic, um, you know, values like collaboration and a sense of community. These are some of the things that we're also able to kind of um, tide us over um, these very um, trying times and, um, you know, the wave of changes that has overcome our society at this time. So um, I'm just supposed to um, really uh, introduce uh, Gandang Kalikasan or Human Nature before we jump into um, what we uh, as an organization has done. Um, uh, I'm sure not many will be familiar with Gandang Kalikasan, so I'll just um, try to um, give you a short uh, background on who we are. Let me just um, share my screen. Okay. Is this um, visible now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so as um, Lisa mentioned, thank you for introducing us and thank you for um, giving us this um, platform to also uh, share our story. Uh, Human Nature is actually more than a decade old. We're 11 years um, 
uh, this year, uh, we started uh, in 2007-2008. That was a time when social enterprises were only beginning to gain traction in um, the global stage. Um, you know, it was starting to be discussed as the uh, really a um, uh, a new solution for a lot of the. Um, societal ills that we are uh, experiencing uh, then and up to now. Um, and since then, I think we've um, created a very vibrant community of social um, enterprises in the Philippines, in the region, and all around the world. Uh, so my co-founders and I, uh, we all came from uh, a non-government organization called Gawad Kalinga. It was a movement in the Philippines that sought to uplift the poor by building dignified communities as the hub or the starting point for a holistic approach or um, solution to poverty. So um, the, the GK model, what it was really known for was um, providing, the most visible was um, providing homes, building physical communities, um, empowering leadership, and um, starting youth uh, educational programs. So it was really a multi-pronged um, approach where um, interventions had a lot of components and programs. Um, but uh, admittedly, the livelihood models um, um, that we wanted to start um, back then when we when we were doing Gawad Kalinga um, had a bit of difficulty in scaling unlike the other programs like the shelter program, the values formation, the community empowerment. Um, so by the time um, that we were thinking about starting a, a business or a social enterprise. There were already over 2,000 GK communities. Uh, many of them were in Metro Manila, but um, more communities were actually in the provinces. And they had a big potential for productivity, but not a lot of opportunities to really um, channel um, that productivity and for um, people in the GK communities to participate in the market. So uh, human nature was really our way of filling that gap. Um, the three of us, we had uh, business experiences in varying degrees, Dylan having the most experience in industry. So um, Camille and I had experience in um, um, corporate uh, cosmetics and uh, marketing industries, where, whereas Dylan had a lot of experience in um, retail and direct selling. Um, he was in the computer games industry. Uh, and we wanted to see if we could put um, those experiences to good use, not just to benefit ourselves, but also to benefit others, um, given our um, exposure and the values um, that we learned um, in Gawad Galinga and also seeing the problem firsthand working as volunteers in the community. Um, so it was like trying to marry both those two different experiences, our business experience, our corporate experience with our development experience. So we thought that um, if business could benefit a few, why not use um, you know, the discipline of business to also serve people who needed it the most? Um, so that's how Human Nature was born, and we um, were founded on these values of being pro-Philippines, pro-poor, and pro-environment. Um, even before we we went to market, we really wanted to be clear about um, our reason for setting up the business, and um, this kind of tagline really guided us um, then and even up to now, um, much so that we haven't changed it for all of the 11 years that we've um, been in existence. So in the beginning, we were just thinking primarily of benef benefiting poor farming communities because um, Camille and I had this idea um, that we could connect with um, GK farming communities to now serve this emerging um, natural uh, products movement. Um, we observed this first in the U.S. and we also saw it in the Philippines that more and more um, of uh, consumers were really um trying to adapt a more natural lifestyle and that was in food, so more organic food and even in um, fast moving consumer goods like personal care, home care. And um, we wanted to connect um, the GK farming communities to the market by um, including them in the value chain. So our idea was to encourage them to um, 
diversify and to include more high value cosmetic ingredients amongst the crops that they were uh, they were growing but then we soon realized that we were also having an impact on another disadvantaged group that we didn't really um, uh, identify in the beginning um, they seem to be overlooked by many because um, most people didn't think of um, this group of people as impoverished anymore. These were the working poor. So daily wage earners, contractuals, um, specifically factory workers, store merchandisers, warehouse workers. Um, so many are see, are, have now um, turned them to be um, the working poor or the invisible poverty because they seem to be gainfully employed. They seem to um, be able to bring home some income, not realizing that there's so many um, systemic problems in, um, in the labor market, especially in the Philippines, that was not being addressed. Um, so much so that the World Bank actually uh, published a report in January of 2016 um, that said that pervasive in work poverty where workers remain below the poverty line despite having jobs is the main challenge for the Philippine labor market despite the economic growth in the last decade. So um, this was also our the identified problem that we saw um, in, uh, you know, wages that were way below what is needed for people to have better quality of life. And then there was the systemic um, contractualization where and people cannot really get a leg up um, in life because they constantly have to um, get laid off and find new work. Um, and among other things, a lot of other um, challenges in, in this setup. So um, in response to the problem of um, you know, providing a uh, livelihood for GK communities as well as um, addressing the problems with in-work poverty. Uh, we started uh, Human Nature and um, given that that was the problem that we had in mind and to be able to address those um, problems that we have identified, we've really um, crafted our policies to uh, answer those specific problems. So this is just like a... Um, some of the policies that we have um, instituted over the years, not all at the same time. Um, this was grown um, for the last um, 11 years, but the top ones were one of the first ones that we decided to implement even before we actually started um, earning money from it. So our one of our uh, main policies and still is our biggest value is providing a living wage. Um, so in 2008, uh, minimum wage in Metro Manila was less than 400 pesos. It was 382 um, pesos. And that was already for those who were uh, formally employed. Even more so, you can imagine how how much lower the daily wage was for those who are not even um, able to get a, a formal employment. So it was 382, and then we early on we recognized that that wasn't enough because what's legal is not necessarily what's right. So we were committed to um, providing a, a living wage, a just dignified wage for all of our workers, regardless of the position, to concretely elevate their quality of life. So um, we weren't earning anything yet, but we made a commitment to pay higher than minimum wage. So at the time, we could afford 500 pesos uh, a day. And throughout the years, we've really um, worked hard to uh, raise our internal minimum wage. So in 10 years, um, the Philippine minimum wage has not even breached the 600 peso mark. So it, we're still in the mid 550s or five uh, high five uh, before below 600 but in human nature we went from 500 pesos to now over a thousand pesos um, per day so that's our internal uh, minimum wage for our uh, employees so that's effectively double for metro manila and more than double um, outside metro manila um, apart from that uh Again, one of the main um, problems that we wanted to address was uh, contractualization. So we decided from the beginning that we were going to regularize people um, for, for positions that were really um, crucial for the business or critical for the business, even though traditionally in other um, companies similar to us, they were outsourced. 
and these were contractual positions. Um, our reason for that is to provide job security and tenure um, that provides a solid foundation for our people, uh, not just to grow in their skills, but to be able to plan for the future and to really have that solid foundation for them to, to build um, for their families. Um, and then another uh, controversial policy that um, has been um, widely debated also in many uh, groups that we've uh, joined is our no firing policy. Um, and this stems from our value of um, not giving up on our people despite errors and um, you know, realizing that when you work with disadvantaged groups, it's really a developmental um, relationship. You can't expect them to have the same um, skills, to have um, the same starting point as others who were not given, you know, um, as others who've had the education, who've had the training, who've had even the nutrition or um, you know, the background um, in their early years to be able to really um, provide the expectation that we are um, asking from them. So um, the no firing policy is our commitment to keep um, working with them, to also keep reflecting on our own policies and our own leadership to ensure that um, we really see their total development over a long period of time um, as our goal. And also, it's a sign to them that uh, we're never going to give up on them, despite um, the challenges that comes with working with, um, you know, with communities, working with um, people from um, disadvantaged groups also. And it's our own um, commitment to learning um, with them on how to make this model work best. Um, and we've got a lot of other things. I, I believe we're also going to provide copies of what we'll talk about here, but I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, but you can see it on the screen. Um, very important to us is you know work on Sunday um, because it, again, it's not just the focus on the economic benefits or being able to develop people um, in, in, in terms of um, giving them more income and um, moving them up the uh, economic ladder, but it's really uh, about quality of life, um, allowing them to uh, have time with their families, allowing them to develop and um, explore um, new skills, educate themselves, and also coming together and um, uh, practicing their faith. So faith is a very important component of human nature. Um, we're known to be a social enterprise, but many people also don't realize that we're a uh, faith-led organization and we do the things that we do because we believe that it's our um, calling and it's our purpose um, from, you know, being called by God to do this, to serve the poor, to serve others also. Um, apart from that, I just wanted to point out about our, again, to, um, to serve the um, objective of improving quality of life. We've um, worked on uh, shortened work hours especially when um in the in in, in the philippines uh there's so many um problems in terms of our transportation in terms of getting to work and um sometimes just getting to work and coming back eats up more than three hours of our time already and this was really in response to wanting to ensure that we were focused on productive work but at the same time being able to balance um family life, quality of life, and work so that it doesn't uh, overtake everything in the um, lives of our people. So our um, what we always say is that we need to keep in mind that we work to live and not live to work. And we don't want to um, our comfort or our um, that we will benefit on the backs of exploiting, um, you know, other people who are forced to work also. Um, for, for us to be able to enjoy um, life. And again, um, we've been working towards no night shift. Um, this is also in response to um, ensuring better health uh, and wellness for our people. Um, so it's not it's not all about the bottom line. It's really all it's all about um, human development and um, quality of life. Um, so apart from um, those policies, we really wanted to see if uh, the policies that we've um, 
come up with um, was making a difference. So there was a lot of anecdotal evidence, but um, as early as 2016, I believe, or 2015, we've been in talks with Isaiah, with Lisa and her team to help us to measure whether these policies um, were actually working because we could see um, that you know, it was improving the lives of our people just from the um, f from what they would share with us. But we wanted to have a more quantitative uh, way of measuring our impact. So we um, worked with Isaiah and we developed this tool um, founded on the model of a development index study. And um, we conducted a survey of 172 of our workers who, who have been with us between three to 10 years. And then we measured across four um, areas. So one is quality of life, meeting basic needs. So I was already talking a lot about our policies geared towards improving that. And then another one was managing their finances. Um, I wasn't able to include it in my presentation, but we had a lot of programs on financial stewardship and training them also to be able to um, be able to manage their um, resources better. And then the third um, area was um, how they were developing in the workplace in terms of in terms of skills, in terms of knowledge and performance and their attitude. And then the final area that we uh, measured was how they were growing in terms of their spiritual community involvement and leadership, whatever um, uh, faith they belonged in at that time. So it was important that they were also um, looking at giving back and not just um, uh, focused on their own uh, development. So we measured across these um, four areas and um, the objective was to see whether there was really a measurable impact of the policies that we had. And um, to also point us in terms of where we could improve. And um, we were very, very, uh, not the much surprised, but we were happy to see that in terms of numbers, we were really able to meet, um, you know, the changes and we were seeing the impact in at least three of the four areas. So meeting basic needs, financial management and work performance. And there's really great numbers here in terms of, um, you know, almost 90% were able to meet the needs of their families. Um, the quality of their meals have improved, whereas before it was just um, rice and um, soy sauce. Now there was more meat, there was more vegetables and um, more nutritious um, meals that they were serving. Um, and of course, almost 100% had access to um, health services because across the board, whether you're rank and file um, or manager level, everyone had um, private health insurance, so they could now go to the doctor, they could get hospi hospitalized if they needed to. Um, that was no longer a concern. And in terms of um, managing their finances, it was also a great improvement in terms of being able to get out of debt, having um, savings and um, improving their borrowing habits. So they were now planning for the future and not just living for the day. And um, of course, in terms of work performance, we structured our organization. So there's a lot of mentoring. There's a lot of values formation and not just on the hard skills, but also on the soft skills. We even have... Um, life groups to help them deal with relationships at home, how to deal with jealous husbands when the wives start working and stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, uh, the programs that you don't normally see in a work setting that um, has shown that it's benefited our people as well. Unfortunately, the area that um, in 2018 and 2019 that we um, realized we needed to work on more was um, the involvement of our people in the community in giving back and serving because they were now so focused on um, their own personal development, economic development. It seemed like um, their uh, community involvement was falling behind. And this was something that we took to heart and um, we really, uh, strive to uh, improve in terms of um, um, sharing uh, how they can grow in their faith, how can they grow in service to the community as well. Um, so this was such a great help for human nature when we partnered with Isaiah to do the development index study because not only did it validate our um, policies, but it also helped us to diagnose where else we could improve on.
Um, just to also share in terms of our work with um, the farming communities. So this was really one of the main um, advocacies that we started out, Human Nature started out. And, um, you know, it has really been a struggle, but at the same time, has been very fulfilling, especially working with the uh, citronella farming communities because up to now, our bug shield is one of our top selling products. And um, because, you know, this has really been uh, core to our, who we are, uh, we have uh, dedicated um, all of the profits from the bug shield to our community development efforts. So we're working with three communities in Bukidnon for our citronella. We also work with um, BCO communities for our um, uh, a lot of our products like shampoo, soap, our lip scrub. We work also with um, uh, Muscovado sugar producers, organic sugar pr producers for some of our um, products. And um, just on the left side, you can see some of the challenges that we've met and how we were able to respond um, through the years. Um, and even during the pandemic, um, we we ensured that we were continuing to buy from the farming communities because um, we were really working very hard for the survival of human nature and we were preparing and um, really looking uh, into the future and thinking how we will still be able to serve um, our customers. Um, so part of that was ensuring also that we would continue to buy um, the ingredients from our farming communities. So it not just... Um, uh, help them in terms of um, being able to have um, continuous income during the pandemic, but it also helped us to ensure business continu continuity even beyond um, the pandemic. Um, so uh, that's a good transition because um, I think this is the first time that we're talking about um, how uh, we're sharing how um, we were able to respond during the time of the pandemic. And I'm going to actually turn you over to my co-founder, Dylan Wilt, to um, share more about how human nature um, was able to um, see um, the challenges as opportunities um, for our social enterprise, for our business to, um, to adapt and to survive um, during these really um, challenging times. Um, so Dylan? Hello there. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen. Okay. Stop share, there. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you're all from the Philippines or if some of you are from outside the Philippines, but uh, if you're from outside the Philippines, then I just want to let you know that, uh, you know, here in the Philippines, we're used to things like COVID. It's uh, nothing new for us. We're used to super typhoons. We're used to floods, volcanic eruptions. We just had that a few months ago. Uh, dengue outbreaks. Every year we have power outages, water shortages, apocalyptic traffic, anything, you name it, we've got it. So when COVID happened, uh, we didn't really go into meltdown. We, didn't, we weren't really terrified. We, we just got used to a lot of uh, difficult things coming along. And uh, back in March, the government first announced uh, that there would be two weeks of lockdown in Metro Manila. Um, but when we heard the announcement, we really expected it to go on uh, much longer than two weeks. Uh, we thought it would go on for a long time because of the way that it was being communicated uh, in the media and by politicians, not just here, but all over the world. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of fear. And so, um, you know, when you scare a population into thinking that if they catch something, they're gonna, they, unfortunately, they're gonna die, then it's very difficult to walk back from that perception unless there's a cure. But we also knew that there are no vaccines yet for SARS or MERS or, uh, or, or most of the other coronaviruses. And so we really expected a long lockdown. And so right at the very beginning, in the first two weeks, uh, we already explained to our staff that we expected it to go on for quite a long time. And we started to prepare uh, in case it lasted until uh, the end of May or even end of June. So thankfully, we, we're classified as an essential supplier because we produce soap, we produce sanitizers. And so we were allowed by the government to partially operate, uh, but only 50% of our staff could work. 
and almost all our franchise stores closed. Uh, even those which were allowed to open wanted to close. Our franchisees wanted to close because, uh, of course, they were afraid of the virus. And so um, we had to go through a process of helping to educate our people uh, and our franchisees to really understand who is at risk and who is not as much at risk. Uh, so we set up all the pro safety protocols that were prescribed. I went to work in the warehouse for a day as well, just to show uh, that we were not sending anyone to work in a role that we were not prepared to do ourselves. Um, and so uh, there was so much panic, mass panic, mass hysteria because of what was being put out by the media. Uh, we really had to try to calm everyone down, try to show um, using reports from around the world who is at risk and who is not at risk. And so uh, one by one, the franchisees started to reopen and people started to be willing uh, to return to work. And we also advised all our people to start saving their money. Right from middle of March, we were advising people not to spend on things they didn't need, but just to uh, save their money. And so as you heard from Anna, uh, we're also a faith-driven company. And so right at the beginning, uh, we really prayed and I, I felt God reassuring us not to be afraid of this, but to really prepare for a period of famine, a period when we wouldn't have enough of many things. Um, so from the beginning, you know, after getting that assurance uh, in, in our prayer time that things would be okay, uh, we, we decided to constantly daily uh, try to remind our people of God's goodness and how he'd cared for us for the last 11 years. Uh, we have a fantastic HR team who are genuinely caring and loving. And so they really helped a huge amount. They set up daily prayer time at I'm 8 that, yeah. in the morning and 12 noon every day. Um, they, they sent out reflections every day, uh, Bible verses and, uh, and that kind of thing to, to help our people feel assurance that they're not just in it on their own. And so once, once we'd done that and we had that realization, this is going to go on for quite a while. Uh, we then looked into how long we could really survive based on different projections. Uh, we, we were really expecting sales to be low and our cash flow looked really bad. You know, we're, we're not a cash rich company. Uh, we're a social enterprise. And so even the optimistic projections that we had uh, really showed that we couldn't keep paying our salaries for more than a few weeks. And so very quickly, we, we realized we, we were faced with two options. Uh, option number one we had to, that we had was that we could choose to let some people go um, in order to protect the jobs of the rest. But we knew, of course, that meant throwing all of our people that we would be letting go out into a world uh, where they were not likely to get any other job. And so this was completely against everything that we stand for. You know, we have that no firing policy. We've had that for 11 years. And so uh, we saw this option of firing people, letting some people go so that we could protect the rest. We saw this as a uh, almost a cowardly act, you know, of selfishness at a time when there was no other option for those people. Those people we would have let go would have had no income, no chance of getting another job. So, of course, our other option was that we would have to keep everyone, but that meant that everybody I would have to sacrifice. Nobody would be able to have their normal salary until things got back to normal. And so we spoke to our leaders. Uh, this was around um, third week of March. And uh, it was unanimous from all of our leaders that we would protect everybody. So we have a mantra in human nature. It is in Tagalog, walang iwanan. It means nobody gets left behind. And so we announced to the whole company uh, that, that we were going to stand or fall together that nobody in human nature would be laid off. Nobody would be sent home with no pay, but we would find a way uh, to get everybody through it. And so we uh, realized that we couldn't pay anybody their regular salary. So we decided that instead of that, for the time being, we would pay everybody a stipend, which was just 5,000 pesos per employee every two weeks. 5,000 pesos is about uh, 100 US dollars every two weeks if they could not work. This was regardless of their position or their normal salary, everybody would get the same. For those who could work, which was about half of our people, um, they were going to receive that plus a little bit extra for the time being, just enough for the basics. So this was just enough for food. 
This was not enough for rent or anything like that. But thankfully, here in the Philippines, rents, utility bills, and so on, the government announced that, that they, they all needed to be held. held. Um, nobody, nobody would be able to. Oops, sorry. I think. Uh, so they would all be held. Nobody would be forced to pay their rent or forced to pay their utility bills. So we decided that all the rest of the salary. Um, so, sorry, ju just uh, hold on a second. So yeah, I was getting a lot of feedback there. So we were just going to give that stipend uh, for the time being and all the rest of the salary that these people were earning would be paid at a later date. So we also decided, of course, that only people who are not in at-risk groups uh, would be asked to work and the others would not be asked to come to work. So personally, it really saddened me uh, when I started reading about companies that were laying off a lot of people due to the crisis, um, one that um, perhaps a lot of you might have read was Airbnb. Airbnb wrote uh, what was really a fantastic letter to their staff explaining um, the layoffs. It was very well written, but ultimately what it meant was they were sacrificing a big chunk of people so that the lifestyle of the others in their company would not change. They were letting go of, I think, about 25% of their people, 4,000 people, so that they could continue paying full salary to everyone else. And it, it really upset me reading it. You know, I felt sick reading it, actually, and I realized we couldn't do that. So our first big decision as a social enterprise was not to leave anyone out, not to leave anyone behind. We would stand or fall together, side by side. So our second big decision was that we would stay true to who we were, no matter what. And that meant uh, that even though we were struggling financially, our sales were down by more than 50% at the beginning. But even so, we decided that we were going to continue to care for the poor. And so we started hearing that a lot of communities were going hungry. Here in the Philippines, uh, no work means no pay for most people. And most people here don't have any savings whatsoever. So on the first or the second day that you're not allowed to work due to the lockdown, many people were already going hungry. And so within a few days, uh, we started hearing from our employees who lived in some of these communities or close to them that a lot of people were going hungry and we started buying food. And so again, our HR team um, came in very useful. They went around these different communities to check what the need was, how many families were there without food, going hungry. And we started uh, buying food in bulk. And so we made a decision um, that we would not just choose who we would give to, but every community that, that, was, that we heard of that was really in need, we would try to find a way to support them. And so we, we would put together these food packs of five kilos of rice and a few cans of sardines um, for every family and noodles. Uh, and that would be enough at least for them to survive for a week. And so... Um, We'd been doing that for a couple of weeks. And then we heard from a friend of ours uh, who helps the poor in Payatas, one of the biggest slum areas in the Philippines. Uh, he told us that um, he, he, there was just a huge, a staggering amount of hunger there. And so I asked him how many families did he think were going hungry? And so he thought about it and uh, he came back to me the following day and he did some checking and, and he said he thought it was around 10,000 families. So my first reaction was, oh, my goodness, how are we going to feed 10,000 families? But we decided we were going to do it. So we announced it. We, he actually told us the Friday before Easter, a week before Easter, he told me it was going to be 10,000. So by Monday, we already decided that we were, going to, um, we were going to start raising money for it. We knew we could not afford to do it on our own. It was going to be about 4 million pesos a week, about 80,000 US dollars a week. And so we went to our customers, we went to our, our dealers. We have about uh, 60 or th so thousand dealers in the Philippines who sell human nature. We went to them, we posted it all over Facebook asking for help. In fact, I'll try to share, <coughs> I'll try to share some of these Facebook posts uh, with you. Let me have a look if I can get this up. Okay, so here's, here's the post that we put out. We put this out on the Monday before Easter. So we knew that by Thursday of that week, all the stores would be closed. Everything would be closed. 
um, because of Easter here in the Philippines, everything shuts down from Thursday to Sunday during Easter week. And so we put this out on the Wednesday. I'm going to try and show you, um, show you this. So we put this out asking for help. This was on the Monday. By this time, we'd already given out yeah, about almost 4,000 food packs. We'd been doing it for a couple of weeks. Um, but we were really crying out to our, our community to help feed 10,000 families by Wednesday. That was two days later. So we'd fed almost 4,000 families in about two weeks. Now we were going to try and feed 10,000 families uh, within two days. And we had no idea how it could happen. It seemed impossible, but, but again, we felt during our prayer time, God telling us to go and declare this publicly. So we did. So we put this out and we just invited people to help. And um, by Wednesday, we'd raised about, uh, again, about another 3,000 food packs, but it was not the 10,000 that we needed. And then at about 4 p.m. on Wednesday, we had a phone call from someone saying uh, that they had uh, 10,000 cans of sardines uh, that were dented. This was a sardine manufacturer. They said these can cans were dented, um, and would they be, would, but the food inside was still okay. And did we want to take them? So we said, sure, yes, we definitely, we want to take them. So that was about 4 p.m., about 4 p.m. on uh, the Wednesday. By 6 p.m., we'd gone to pick them up. By 8 p.m., we were delivering them into uh, Payatas uh, just a few hours later. And so uh, it wasn't, you know, enough food maybe for the whole week, but at least it was something for everyone, for 10,000 families. We used the other money for the rest of the, the components, like yeah. the rice. So in fact, we actually reached the 10,000 by the deadline, which was in itself, you know, a miracle. That's right. So it was a real miracle. Uh, we were able to get food to the 10,000 families just in time. And so, um, you know, when we think about social enterprise, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to solve problems that nobody solved. Governments haven't been able to solve them. The most intelligent minds have not been able to solve them. Um, and we're not going to do it either on our own power. We really need God's power with us if we're going to make any impression, if we're going to make any dent. If we're going to bring change, we're going to have to do the impossible. So many people look at our no firing policy and they say that's impossible. But I take inspiration from Jesus. Jesus said, uh, these things are impossible for man, but nothing is impossible for God. And so all of these things we've been trying to do, double the minimum wage, um, that no firing policy, closing on Sunday, even though it's the busiest shopping day of the week. These are things that we could only do because of our faith, our strong faith. And this story of feeding the 10,000 uh, families was also really a, a story of faith. We just felt God telling us to declare it. We declared it. Two days later, he sent the 10,000 cans. We didn't do anything to raise those. Someone just called us out of the blue. And so, um, you know, after that, uh, we, didn't, we just didn't know how we could keep feeding all these families uh, remember, our, our cash flow was not good. We were not a cash-rich company. We were not paying our own staff their salaries. They were all on a stipend. But we just decided that we would not stop giving. Whoever came to us, whichever community came, we would assess them. We would check if they're really hungry. And if they were, we would keep praying for help and keep feeding them. And so we made use of our website. Um, we changed our website uh, from just a pure um, uh, cosmetics company website we are uh, the first thing that you would see when you went to our website was a request for help for the poor to give uh, food supplies and we were able to to raise what we needed so we ended up uh with people from all over the world giving our franchisees many of whom were too scared to open at the beginning they started donating our dealers our customers even our suppliers started giving and so um we just decided to trust god and he proved himself faithful yet again. And so all the way through this, another way that um, we were able to manage was uh, in terms of our suppliers. We wrote to all of our suppliers right at the beginning, again, right in the middle of March at the start of this. We asked for their permission uh, to delay payments that we needed to make to them by 30 days. The small suppliers, our farmers and our communities, we kept paying them on time, but the bigger suppliers, uh, were asked to wait. 
for the money that we owed them. And most agreed. Um, the few that didn't, we kept on negotiating with them. And eventually everyone agreed to some delay. Uh, some just agreed to 15 days. Others agreed to the 30 days that we wanted. And so, uh, yeah, we survived. We survived because we have incredible people in human nature, uh, an incredible team. We had many people who were sleeping in our factory and in the warehouse uh, so that they could safely work without exposing their families to the virus. Uh, we have many people in the company who had some savings. They decided to take no salary at all, not even their stipend that they were entitled to. We had others who donated their stipend to others in the company. Some donated even their leaves, their vacation leaves, their sick leaves, so that it could be given in cash to others. Um, there's no public transport. Or there, was, there was no public transport for quite a long time, about a month. Uh, even now in the Philippines, there's very limited public transport. So many of our people who have cars, they're going around shuttling other employees in and out every morning and night. Our telesales team, our customer service team, they were very heavily burdened because suddenly we had about double the number of people that we usually get who wanted to buy online and wanted to buy through the phone. Um, of course, so that we could deliver products to them. Many of them were, were not able to buy in the supermarkets anymore, so they went online. And so our telesales team were working till midnight or even later every day um, for a few weeks until we found ways to train other people and help relieve the pressure on them. And, and our people just generally encouraged one another, built each other up. They wrote letters to each other. They sang songs to one another. They had contests, you know, all sorts of things just to get through it, smiling. And so in the end, our cash flow ended up uh, much better than we expected. Our sales were better than we expected. Um, the government announced that we could uh, defer payment of taxes, which was a huge help as well. That saved us a lot. And so our employees were on their stipend of um, 5,000 pesos, about $100 um, every two weeks. But they were on that stipend for six weeks. And then at the end of May, we started increasing what we could pay them again. And this coming June 30th, next week, we will finally be able to return uh, to paying full salaries for all our staff. And we've been able to start repaying some of the back pay um, already as well. And so this is after feeding uh, more than 16,000 families, uh, the majority of which, maybe 70% or more, was funded by donations in the end, just because we asked for help. And so um, throughout this, uh, we've really kept something very close to our heart. Right at the very beginning, um, from March, um, God gave me a passage from the Bible, and it's Psalm 91. And I, I remember as I uh, looked at it for the first time, uh, you know, really my eyes welled up with tears because it's just what we needed to hear at the beginning of this. When we looked at our cash flow, it looked like we could not make it. Um, we had no idea how long it would go on. We just knew it was going to be a long time. And then God sent us this passage. Um, I want to share this with you as well. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try and uh, screen share this. Where is it here? Um, so I want to read it out to you. This is Psalm 91. And it says, whoever lives in the shelter of the Most High will, rough, will, will rest, will also rest in the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, if you live in the shelter of the Most High, if you spend your life trusting him, being faithful to what he teaches, you can claim the right to rest in his shadow, to take rest. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the hunter's trap and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is your body armor and shield. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. And so that was the, our theme throughout all of this. And we prayed that over all of our staff at the start of this. And uh, God has really been faithful throughout uh, COVID. We're still on part, partial lockdown here in the Philippines. We're still in quarantine, partial quarantine. Kids have not been allowed out of their houses since the middle of March. Um, um, many uh, people, millions of people have lost their jobs. Um, but I believe that uh, God showed us uh, how to survive it. And it was not to sacrifice our people and not to sacrifice our values, but to stand up 
for what we believed in uh, right from the beginning, even during these difficult times. And uh, because of that, I believe he took care of us uh, through all of this. So I hope that helps you. <laughs> if you have questions, we can take questions. Uh, here, Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dylan. And thank you very much, Anna. Um, I think we have a question here from uh, C.P. Lopez, who owns the farms and the produce and raw materials that are harvested from them. In order for human nature to come out with its cosmetic products, certain processing were needed. Are these processes outsourced or done by human nature itself? Okay. I think so you need to explain that. more about uh, what you do as human nature. Okay, then. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so the farming communities that we work with, the farms are owned by the farmers. Um, in the beginning, when we start working with them, um, we uh, sometimes provide the equipment for them because very often they don't have processing equipment. They may be able to grow crops like citronella or lemongrass, um, but they don't uh, often have the money to be able to buy the equipment to process it. And so um, frequently in the past, we've given that, we donate it. And usually when we start working with them, the way that we do it is we don't just look at the market price for their um, produce. Um, we, we actually sit down and produce an entire business plan for them. So we figure out how long do they spend um, uh, sowing the seed? How long do they spend weeding? How long do they spend harvesting? Hauling what even. even hauling it? What's the cost if they need a, a carabao or something to haul it to the, to the processing area? Um, uh, what is the cost of the inputs? Um, all of those things. And then we figure out, okay, what is the uh, what should be the daily wage that people are able to earn? What's a dignified daily wage that the farmer is able to earn? And we put all of that into a business plan. And then the amount that comes out tells us what we should be paying for that product. So for example, citronella, when we started using that uh, 10 years ago, there were a group of farmers that tried to sell it to us at 775 pesos per kilo. But when we sat down and studied how much it really costs them to produce it, it was costing them more than 700 pesos to produce. And so we, we uh, immediately uh, decided to pay them more. I, I forget the amount in those days. I think it was about 1,100 that we were yeah. paying. Yeah, today we pay 1,100. Today we pay about 1,600 per kilo, uh, even though the market price is still hovering around 800 to 900 pesos. Um, and so again, you know, uh, we don't just look at the market price, we've got to look at what is the real cost to them in their labor, in their time, and put a value on that. And so the processes of uh, creating many of the uh, raw materials are done in the farms themselves. Um, they produce it. Uh, in the beginning, we often also include um, a budget for someone that we put in place to help train them. Um, and uh, help develop the community until they're able to stand on their own feet. We, we, we collaborate sometimes with uh, Gawad Kalinga GK, uh, the NGO um, that has been putting up all of these uh, communities um, around the country that Anna talked about earlier as well. So um, we often uh, collaborate with them. They do the community development. We provide the funding. We provide the, uh, the training in terms of, the, um, in, in terms of how to process. Um, but then, of course, what we get is raw materials, and we have our own factory and a team of scientists who then turn those into products like shampoo and lotions and moisturizers and things like that. So we have now a fairly big team. We have about 20 people in our research and development team. Uh, they create all our formulations from scratch. Not all the ingredients come from farming communities. Um, I would say probably still the majority come from outside from big suppliers. De definitely the majority come from big suppliers. Some are still imported, but we really prioritize local ingredients. Only if it's not produced here, that's the time we would consider yeah. importing it. Because for example, when you create shampoos, the main, the, the majority of the ingredients are um, surfactants, um, which are still naturally derived, but it, the technology to produce surfactants are still um, not widespread. There's actually one, um, supplier from the Philippines that produces coconut-based um, surfactants. Um, so we've been very intentional in using more of that in our formulations, but um, all other types of surfactants are still not produced in the Philippines. 
So what we can produce here whenever we hear of like something new in terms of um, natural cosmetic ingredients that is locally produced, we immediately um, study it, look into that and um, explore if we can then use it in our formulations. Yeah. So when we started, it was very simple. Um, we didn't have our own factory then. Um, we, we just had very simple formulations. We were working with a third party formulator. But little by little, we built all these things in over the last 11 years. We started our factory about, um, yeah, how long ago now? Six years ago, something like that. Um, yeah, six years ago then. Uh, and the reason we built our own factory was because we realized that even though we claim to be a social enterprise, the very people manufacturing our products who are toll manufacturers were contractual employees earning minimum wage with no benefits. And so uh, we spent quite a while trying to convince the toll manufacturers to allow us to put in additional bonuses or incentives or something for the people that were working on our products, but they all refused. And so in the end, we thought this, we can't in good conscience carry on this way. We've got to, we're going to have to start making these ourselves. So we, so we then figured out how to build our own factory, which was very painful. Yeah. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have another question here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read it. I've always uh, admired that human nature has managed to operate as a faith-based company. I wanted to follow what you have done in your company, especially being faith-based. It turned out to be a real challenge to do that, but we're still trying. My question is, how do you handle employees with a really bad attitude problems? As much as we don't want to fire people, we end up firing so far two people in separate times because of their attitude. Okay, so this is really, as I said during my introduction, one of our most um, controversial policies. And um, admittedly, it's not easy to, um, to live by. And up to now on a daily, not on a daily, but on a regular basis, um, it, it's being put to test. But um, we, because we have a no firing policy, but we also have a no coddling policy. So it means that um, we are committed to ensure that people are also developing and giving their best at work. So um, we, we tell them that they're never going to be fired, but at the same time, we have um, disciplinary um, processes to ensure that they are always um, reminded on how it is to give their best at work. Um, we've had instances when despite, you know, going through the disciplinary process, they're not, um, um, they're still not improving. So we have um, different courses of action. They can either be, uh, first of all, there is the warning, then we have suspensions. And then even with suspensions after that, if that still doesn't work, then they have to be transferred to a different um to a different uh, um, role, um, which most of them don't like because they're used to the um, to the position they've been given. Um, for most, um, actually, majority of our cases, those um, those remedies have worked for us. But then there were still instances where it really um, doesn't didn't um, work. And then in the end, it's um, the employee who decides already that you know um, it's not the place for them because they're not. Uh, developing. They're not thriving in our um, company. Well, just to add to that, um, this is, um, okay, why do we have this policy, first of all? Well, it's quite simple. Um, number one, we're a social enterprise, and so we exist for them. They don't exist for us. But secondly, if God did not give up on us with all the mistakes we made, then we shouldn't give up on the people he sends. And so when we work with the poor, we know that they didn't have the same role models we had. They didn't have the same, um, same uh, upbringing that we had um, or opportunities that we had. And so I believe in tough love. So for example, if you're regularly late to work in human nature, uh, we, we have a farm a couple of hours away uh, and we're gonna send you to that farm. And you're gonna start work at 4 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. <laughs> for a few days. And then uh, basically until you start coming on time. And what we find is usually once people have done that for a few days, they're never late again. <laughs> no, they, stay, they stay coming to work on time. Um, the worst that we've done is to uh, put people on part-time work and suspend them. And what we, we but, but again, it, you have to have relationship. It, it can't be just the tough without the love. So to sit, down, sit them down and explain why we want them to do well 
You know, we believe in them. We, 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 that can be life-changing for some of them to say that no matter how much you mess up, you're family to us. We're not going to give up on you. Their whole life, they've been told, you're nothing, you're worthless, you're useless. And they believe that. So when you're able to say, we are not going to give up on you, we believe in you, but you're going to change. That can be life-changing for, for a lot of the poor. And so, um, yeah, we've had situations where we put people on part-time work, and then after a few weeks, we were able to put them back on full-time work because they really changed. One person was making a lot of mistakes. Um, she didn't seem to care. We put her on part-time work and within about six weeks, we were able to put her back because she stopped making those mistakes. Um, but it has to be done. It has to be tough love. It has to be the tough with the love. You can't have love with no tough. You can't have tough with no love. Okay, there's another question, I think for, uh, for maybe for Anna. Uh, I'm truly amazed by what you have done for the Anawim, the poor of Yahweh, even in pre-pandemic time. But considering that your products are mostly for women, what are your commitments and programs for women's economic empowerment? In the survey that you conducted during the lockdown, did you look into the differenti differentiated needs of women, children, and the elderly? Actually, majority of our, thank you for that, Zone. Um, majority of our employees up until recently, um, before we opened the factory, it was like majority talaga was women. Overwhelmingly, maybe 85% women and only 15% or even less um, were men. So, and even in terms of when we were, um, uh, when we were hiring for um, permanent positions for merchandisers, for warehouse people, the ones that um, we first uh, hired were women because it seemed that they... Um, were more willing to to work for for something that is unknown because um in the communities that we engage in what we were offering was really in a sense before we were known to be a good employer also um relatively unknown so it was only the women who were taking the opportunities and it turned out also that they were um um willing to take more risks with a unknown company like us and also they were also a lot more conscientious in terms of the work that they were doing um, but after a while um, we were getting a reputation narin, um, that we were good employers and so we were getting more um, applications but it was still mostly women and we were providing um, opportunities for people for for women who um, otherwise would not have been um, given that opportunity because most of their um, their husbands um, wouldn't want to apply for us or they'd much rather work as construction workers or tricycle drivers. Um, we've had issues also where um, women who were working with us um, were having problems um, with their husbands because once they started earning uh, a regular salary, um, the men were also um, starting to feel um, uh, threatened by that. So we had to conduct actually relationship seminars um, to help um, husband and wife to process things and to help husbands also to understand how um, this was um, not a, a threat to um, their being a provider, but this was really a way for them to get out of poverty. So we need to also look at women's issues as something that is connected to men's issues. Because if we just focus on the women, it also alienates the men. So what we've um, taken on is really a, a relationship approach and para empowering our people to um, navigate relationships. And this is not just um, something that is um, unique to you know, uh, people in disadvantaged communities. I think across all um, groups, we need to really look at relationships as also being um, some of the roots of these um, um, problems. So that's one um, area. Another area is um, in our um, dealership. One of the reasons why we opened direct selling was in recognition of the fact that um, a lot of women want to contribute, want to um, uh, also have uh, more income, but then they also have other responsibilities um, and primarily, it's taking care of children. I mean, as a working parent, um, I, I, I feel that very strongly also. 
Um, so a lot of women want to be able to contribute, but they can't also be in full-time office work. So our dealership was geared towards um, giving um, women that opportunity, that option to earn in her own time um, while she's also taking care of um, her children while um, and um, taking into account her, her networking skills because women uh, most of the time are better at networking and um, um, building communities. And this has really worked very well um, for us. And I remember when we started the dealership also, what, who we had in mind was um, public school teachers who despite the fact that they had um, you know, their regular work still um, needed to augment their income by um, selling whatever they could sell, sometimes even to their students. And um, we were thinking this was a way also um, of helping, um, you know, a lot of hardworking um, women to be able to um, augment their income. Another question here, maybe uh, Dylan, you can um, answer this or Anna also. Uh, from Joey or Kula from um, the DSWD, no? he says that uh, they are, we would like to establish a market link with human nature in supplying sustained volumes of virgin coconut oil, which the 40s Women Association have been producing. What are the possibilities for that? Mm, okay. Well, um, currently we work with a number of communities for our VCO. And in terms of what we use, we're already very well supplied. Um, we can't take everything that they produce. So, so they're already selling to a lot of other clients. Um, but if you can put us in touch, Lisa, then we can see if we can uh, help find additional markets um, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, another question from Dor. Um, she's asking about uh, being one of the key players and prime movers in the realm of social enterprises. What forms of repurposing innovation or use of technology or sustainable measures can you suggest to budding social enterprises post-COVID-19? Well, uh, the great opportunities um, for social enterprises uh, which are just starting out or still quite small, to start doing things in a much more sustainable way. Um, there are starting to be new technologies now. For us, um, one of our biggest, uh, one of our biggest um, regrets is that we have to use plastic. We use quite a lot of plastic bottles because most of our liquid products uh, can only really be packaged in, in plastic bottles. Uh, and so what we've been doing for the last um, few months is trying to reformulate our products to take out the water so that they will be dry products. Uh, that way we can pack them in paper without the need for plastic. So for example, shampoo bars is an example of a dry formulation um, that we now use. And um, uh, we thought it was going to be difficult for, to convince people to use that, but actually it's doing very, very well. Um, and uh, we're working on all kinds of other dry products, dry dishwashing bars, dry um, conditioners, dry kids shampoos and um, all sorts of things where we can take out the water. So we're going to be trying to be very, very innovative so that we can get rid of the plastic packaging. Um, but actually Anna works on the sustainability side of human nature much more uh, than I do. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass you on to Anna to, to yeah add to just that. just to add to that. So before um, the pandemic, we were um, really working very hard on the um, refilling station. So we already piloted a uh, a model, a distribution model that um, we were confident that um, meet all of the Food and Drug Administration um, requirements to make sure that they were it was clean. Um, it was standardized. It was um, going to provide a high quality product for our customers. So um, we already rolled that out in our flagship stores and we were in talks with um, FDA. We were even included in the agenda for the um, uh, ASEAN Cosmetic Directive um, to have the new model um, considered for rollout. Um, and then the pandemic hit and then we had to close it down. But um, we were able to just in the last week reopen our refilling stations and we are now um, reviewing our efforts to really advocate um, with the uh, FDA to be able to allow for a wider, more scalable range of products to be refilled because currently we can only refill uh, home 
care products, so detergents, dishwashing liquids, anything that doesn't is not for personal use. But what we're really trying to uh, advocate for, what we're trying to lobby is to allow even personal care products such as shampoos, um, sanitizers, a lot of the low risk um, products um, that is not going to really be prone to um, contamination. So uh, those are the things that, uh, that's one thing that we're doing. And also there's this huge shift now to online um, shipping, which is great in terms of convenience. And it's great that, you know, it allows you to just be able to access the goods that you want um, without leaving the comforts of your home. But it's really um, uh, struck a blow on the sustainability side of things because there's a lot more plastic, there's a lot more packaging, there's a higher carbon footprint that goes into more um, deliveries and higher volume other packages is it means that it's you know higher volume in terms of waste so um, fortunately even before the pandemic we were already also testing instead of bubble wrap instead of plastic to protect your fragile um, items um, during shipping we were um, experimenting with a honeycomb paper type of um, um, cushioning for our products. So instead of the bubble wraps, it's paper. It still has that kind of air, but it's, it, it, looks like, um, it looks like honeycomb. So it provides the same protection for fragile products, but it's biodegradable. It's not plastic. So those are the, some of the things that we've been working on on the um, environmental side um, in terms of really... Um, transforming and um, uh, adapting to more sustainable um, sustainable ways um, of conducting our business. Okay, there's another question from Ian Audio. Oh, I don't know if that's his or her name. How similar or different is a company in terms of R&D, HR policies and advocacies from the body shop? Was this before it was bought by L'Oreal or after it was? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> you can I you can take it any which way. Pre merger or post merger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So would so, you like? Mm. Okay, so Body Shop was really an inspiration for us when we were starting. But I think when we were looking at the Body Shop model, this was before it was bought by big you, conglomerates. Yes. Um, I think a lot of the business practices of Body Shop in terms of, um, you know, how the values that it started with, those were our inspiration. And I think it's some of it is still being carried over even after it was bought by, you know, the big conglomerates. But definitely there are a lot of practices now that align also with um, the earlier values. Um, I think the great thing about Body Shop was that they really – put into our consciousness, into the public consciousness about community trade, about fair trade, because they were one of the first to really um, talk about it in, uh, in a major way and making us um, care about the source of your products, how it was made rather than caring about just the price and the efficacy and the quality of your Product. So in that sense, I think um, companies like Body Shop, Burt's Bees, a lot of the um, earlier um, fair trade and natural products um, companies um, did a great job in um, raising awareness and inspiring um, a lot of other companies who are now um, seeing it as um, not just a nice to have or not just uh, like something that they is uh, good to talk about in terms of PR, but something that is really part of their DNA and part of the reason of, for their existence. Thank you, Anna. Um, there is actually um, another question I'd like to ask uh, before we wrap up, no? because I think we're going, we're almost uh, one hour, 30 minutes now. But I wanted to ask you about uh, your take on social enterprises as vehicles for decent work, given that you are champions of, uh, you know, the sustainable development goal of decent work. Uh, given the pandemic, um, how do you see this uh, in terms of an advocacy? That's your passion. You want to talk well, <laughs> well, all the more, you know, all the more, I think this is a time for social enterprises to uh, show that we're different and to show that our beliefs, our ways of doing things, of um, 
taking care of people, even in the midst of crisis, can work. So I think this is really a time for sticking to what we believe in and remembering that, you know, like I said earlier, we exist for the sake of our poor workers. Uh, they don't exist for us. Um, and so um, I, was very, uh, I, was, I was very happy at the start of this to, to hear from all of our leaders in the company. You know, I was expecting some pushback. I was expecting some people to be complaining that they were only getting a small stipend and asking for more. But nobody did. Everybody just fully got behind it. They really believe in what we stand for. And that was the great test for me. And so I think this is a time for social enterprises to be able to be shown as a different way of doing things. Um, everybody applauds the big companies in the world, you know, the successful companies in the world, but many of them run on a model which is just survival of the fittest, and that leaves everybody else behind. And if we go into more pandemics in the future, you know, political instability, a war, who knows what's coming? Um, you know, if, if people have that mindset, if company owners have that mindset of survival of the fittest, uh, then most of the population will be left out. I remember reading... Uh, maybe um, five years ago or more, about Netflix. And the policy of Netflix was, was really that, that, that they, they don't set policies on how many hours you work and so on and so on, uh, how much vacation time you have. It's all up to you. But basically, if you're not performing, uh, as soon as you start performing, you're fired. And so it's a, it, it works great for the people at the top. It works great for the really clever ones, the really the best of the best. Um, but it doesn't work for anyone else. And I was reading about it because the person in Netflix who came up with that policy was herself fired a couple of years later as a victim of the very policy that she crafted. And uh, yeah, so that, that was my reaction too. I, I basically laughed when I read it. <laughs> but I thought, you know, this is really, that's the re what we see in the world today is the result of that, of that mindset, that it is survival of the fittest. And that, that's capitalism, it's purist, you know. And when, we're the antidote to that. We're the antidote to show that actually you can run a business, uh, but look after people as the primary consideration. Uh, and again, you know, for us, if God is on your side, then it's going to work out. And you've got to get God on your side. You can't do this on your own power. You have to have God with you. Yeah. So maybe before we, maybe before we. Maybe before we wrap up, Anna, would you like to say uh, last words? Because we're almost reaching yeah, 5.30. Yeah, just to kind of build on what Dylan was saying, when you talk about like um, dignified work, I think a lot of it is focused just on the um, economic um, um, like e economic value that we give. But what we've seen also is that, um, you know, workers, people, you value that you see um, quality of life. It's not just the take-home pay. So, you know, um, policies like um, reduced work hours, being able to give them ample rest and, you know, vacation leaves and um, medical care, these are the things that sometimes people value more than the actual um, compensation um, because uh, we're not, the incentive is not just money. Many of us, um, it's really we work because we want to um, provide um, a better life for our families, and especially in the Philippines where family values are very high up. I think it's something that we always need to, to think about. It's not just um, getting people out of poverty and economically, but defining what is uh, you know good quality of life for them. And if that means also that means rest, that means health. And that means relationships. Uh, thank you very much. So I think um, that's about the end of our webinar today, unless um, there are last words from Dylan. And that's okay. I usually want my wife to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Dylan. This has been an a very exciting webinar and i think um it's the first time that we are on li on live streaming yeah 
And so I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating. It's not actually just uh, social entrepreneurs and uh, social enterprise resource institutions and uh, stakeholders of human nature in the Philippines, but also we have some colleagues coming from other countries like Bangladesh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, who have been with us. So thank you very much for your uh, active participation. And thank you again, Anna and Dylan. I would just like to also invite everyone did you want to say something, Anna? No, thank you, Lisa. And to your team. <laughs> yeah. Go more so, yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, we just want to uh, invite everybody to our uh, sixth webinar uh, that's going to happen on, uh, on June 30. Uh, that is going to feature the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement that has supported the development of social enterprises uh, for sustainable agriculture and food security. So with that, thank you very much again and see you at the next webinar. And thank you again, Anna and Dylan. And we look forward to working with you in the um, S Social Entrepreneurship SDG platform for decent work. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.